Let's discuss all of this with Lieutenant Colonel Hal Kempfer, president of KIPP, a strategic risk management firm, and also Middle East analyst Thane Rosenbaum joining us here on set. Welcome, as always. Hal, we'll start with you. The United Arab Emirates, along with Norway, they blame the attacks in the Persian Gulf on a state actor. Any idea why they stopped short of specifically naming Iran? Tall, the only thing I can think of is they, they want to kind of give themselves a little room to maneuver here diplomatically without castigating uh, Iran Ford. Obviously, there really is only one state actor that would logically be, that's Iran. And and the other part of that is, uh, when you look at the sophistication of that mission, you know, I, I've never had to do an underwater vehicle thing at night where I had to attach lipid mines, but I've had to do a lot of tactical things uh, in the water. I've done underwater vehicle work at night. And uh, I can tell you that navigating underwater to uh, find a, uh, a ship and attach a limpet mine and then get back, there's a lot of very careful navigation, a lot of sensors, a lot of things in play. And that kind of leads to it could only be a state sponsor. Now, they probably want to leave it open, but logically, that would probably be Iran. So, Thane, it sounds very logic, but Iranian foreign minister, as we just heard from our Shana Stulin in Washington, he has a different logic. He says the Mossad, the Israeli intelligence, has fabricated these uh, intelligence evidence um, in order to blame Iran. Uh, is Zarif in denial, or is Israel super sophisticated? Well, Israel is super sophisticated, but this isn't the type of work that they usually engage in. <clears throat> usually, if they were engaging this kind of work, they would have done it themselves, and they didn't do it themselves in this case. <clears throat> I think that it's clear that this work was sophisticated, required great operational and intelligence capacity. Um, as we've just heard, this is not for your casual Sunday uh, diver with a snorkel. This is going to require sophisticated work. And Zarif, look. We're at war. <laughs> you can call it what you want, but there are so many phases of this, and this is trying to shift the blame. Yeah, this is the kind of brinksmanship that we're seeing time and time again. And yes, Zarif is in his interest to say, "Hey, this is a terrible, despicable act," but it has nothing to do with us. Of course, it's the Zionist entity. Hell, today the Trump administration, as we reported, hit Iran with new sanctions targeting the country's largest petrochemical company. Why is that so significant? Is it Iran suffocating already, or is the regime, by its actions that we're seeing, proving that Iran can withhold sanctions for a while? Well, Tal, the sanctions are having an effect. Uh, I, I, the, you know, when you look at what's happening in people's homes, they're unable to get certain foodstuffs anymore. Uh, they're doing, they are putting maximum pressure on Iran. The other thing they're doing, which uh, a lot of times we look at Iran, we see a, a kind of a monolithic unified government uh, run by a theocratic extremist uh, group. The reality is Iran is, is a lot of different factions, and the government is various different factions. And by imposing these sanctions on the IRGC specifically, what it does is it's forcing some of these major companies to divest themselves of any connection with the IRGC in order to do anything uh, internationally. And that impacts the IRGC financially. And at some point, the IRGC is going to have to go back to the government and say, look, we can't make money this other way. You're going to have to give us more money. And that's going to get into a little fiscal battle there because, uh, you know, when you have decreasing revenues and then you have a part of the government asking for more revenues. Um, that will cause internal tension, and, and that might be part of the design uh, behind what we're doing. Then I want to ask you about some of the implications on the Iranian pu public uh, of these sanctions. Um, the Statistical Center of Iran is reporting that the prices of consumer goods is really skyrocketing in the country. And I'll give you some examples. The price of meat and poultry increased by 57 percent, vegetables by 47 percent, dairy and eggs by 37 percent. And yet we don't see these big protests against the Iranian regime in the country. Does it mean that everyone is blaming the United States? You know, it's, it's hard to say on that. Also, in terms of sanctions, remember, there's a big difference between sanctioning other countries from doing business with Iran. It's quite another to sanction Iranian country companies themselves in their dealing with their own con country, especially the military. Uh, in terms of, look, you know, this, if you're looking for regime change, uh, and that is clearly what, what uh, uh, national security uh, uh, analyst uh, Bolton has what well, you're, it's if you're not the just, official goal. Right. Well, yes. But if you're really looking for, if that's a, your unofficial goal, uh, the best thing to do is make sure that the, the people themselves can't afford bread and butter. 
uh, and that's what we're seeing. Now, look, we've seen the Green Revolution in Iran. An election was stolen a number of years ago. Uh, the Iranians are very good at pushing down dissent. So it's not surprising to me that both people are suffering and you're not seeing the, the equivalent of an Arab Spring. We're not there yet. We may never get there. And it's partly because Iran is, is incredibly strong when it comes to uh, dealing with its own citizens. Hal, um, I want you both to stick around, but Hal, I also want your thought on this other incident that took place at sea. Uh, a U.S. and Russian warship, you've probably seen the images, nearly colliding in the East China Sea. It happened Friday morning. A group of Russian warships was on a parallel course with the U.S. Naval Strike Group when they came within 100 feet of each other. Both countries blamed the other for the near miss. No one was hurt. Hell, you've seen the images striking. What are your thoughts? What, what could have happened there? Really briefly, please. Uh, that was a deliberate, provocative move by the Russians. Uh, our, our ships had to take evasive action, emergency evasive action, to, uh, in order to avoid a collision. Um, that is going to be a, a discussion uh, between the White House and the Kremlin. Uh, that's the sort of thing that can end up very tragically. And uh, we're fortunate that they didn't actually collide. Lieutenant Colonel Hal Kempfer and Thane Rosenbaum, you're sticking around with us. We have more to discuss with you. Lieutenant Colonel Hal Kempfer and Middle East analyst Thane Rosenbaum are still here with us. Hal, uh, let's start with some background here. Idlib, it's the last rebel-held enclave in northwest Syria. We knew this was the prime target of President Assad and that a Syrian army attack there was just expected since last summer. But until recent weeks, Russia and also Turkey, under pressure from the White House were able to prevent such an attack by their cooperation and joint military patrols in Idlib. So the bloodshed that we're witnessing now there in Idlib is a result for, of Russia changing its strategy on this enclave. What happened that made Russia change its stance? Well, it's, it's difficult to say what exactly the calculation was that made Russia change its stance. But you also have to look at the region. We're coming into summer. Uh, summer there is a is, it's just a more difficult time all around in many ways because of the heat and everything else. And and a lot of times, uh, this is a time of year where you do see launches of attacks because they realize that with decreasing resources of those defending the areas that they might be able to gain some ground rather quickly. So it's not, uh, it's not something we haven't seen in the past. Uh, we just were fortunate that there was this pause in, in pressuring Idlib to uh, basically surrender or to put military pressure on it. Russia, obviously, something's gone on behind the scenes uh, with Turkey. Uh, it could be part of a broader calculation. It could also be that Syria has said, look, we have to regain this territory. This cannot remain something separate from the Syrian uh, nation, if you will, uh, indefinitely. And they've decided to put pressure on the Russians, and the Russians have acquiesced. Well, s some say, uh, Thane, that the reason we're seeing these attacks is because rebels attacked the largest Russian military base in Syria, and some even believe that it's by ammunition that was provided by Turkey making its way into Idlib. Uh, Russia claims that Idlib is controlled by terrorist groups. R remind us, who is in this enclave? Well, <laughs> they are terrorist groups to some degree. Look, remember, the Russians also have an incentive for this to be over. And the best way for this to be over is to get out of the way. And that's another thing that we have to think about. I mean, this has never not been a humanitarian crisis. From, for its entire eight years, civilians have been in harm's way. It has changed the face of Europe. The Syrian refugee crisis is started by this civil war. C civilians have been killed from the very, very beginning. Uh, there have always been various variations of rebel forces that look like ISIS, look like other terrorist organizations. Uh, it's very easy to point fingers at different entities and call them terrorists, and at that point, you have less sympathy, even if civilians are near them. Uh, and but every time we're reaching new highs. We're reaching new highs, but again, I think that there is some sense, Iran feels this way, Russia feels this way, that this is over. Isn't it over? We had always assumed last bastions, last standstill, last area, and then we moved to one other area where there's an enclave where there's still fighters. And so it may be that what we're seeing here is just a last gasp effort to end this, regardless of the consequences to civilian life. Hal, Turkey is a NATO ally and a player, of course, in uh, Syria in the Northwest. And um, they want to buy an advanced missile defense system from Russia. And yet today, the U.S. put its foot down and said, 
if you're going after this purchase, you're not getting the F-35 fighter jets for, from us. Uh, what do you think about that? Is it long overdue? Well, we, we had to put our foot down. You can't have a NATO ally buying uh, their, their primary systems uh, from Russia. Although I will say in Eastern Europe, we kind of inherited a lot of Russian systems uh, when a lot of those countries joined NATO. But we've, what we've been doing is trying to weed that out. Now, with Turkey going this direction, this kind of follows on a number of things that Turkey has done where it's kind of gone on a separate track and uh, and, and frankly, it was probably overdue that we put our foot down on this um, because we're sharing very sensitive technology uh, with Turkey, and then they're getting Russian technology. With Russian technology comes Russian technicians, and uh, that presents a intelligence or security risk. And frankly, we just don't want to see that happen. Dane, I see you're nodding here quickly. I just think, you know, they're nominal allies. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're NATO, but they're not our friends. And so this is not the first incident that we've seen in more recent years, particularly in the, during the Trump administration, that they're going their own way. Uh, and going their own way in this instance means moving toward Russia. And I, we're quite right. If they're a NATO ally, uh, we need them to be purchasing defense systems from us, and they need to be dealing with us and not be showcasing themselves to other places, shopping themselves to other entities that are not NATO allies. It also somehow usually feels that President Trump and President Erdogan are on some sort of a collision course. That's right. I wonder what message is being sent. Is it being right. sent to Erdogan or has it been sent to Russia? Uh, probably both. All right. Thane Rosenbaum, Lieutenant Colonel Hal Kempfer, thank you as always.